parlons de ta parole. Merci de ce que tu savais que ce moment allait arriver. Et qu'ensemble, on va se retrouver pour euh, écouter ta parole. Merci d'inspirer le pasteur Té, de lui donner les paroles justes et convenables pour nous, pour nous édifier, nous raffermir. Merci aussi de rendre notre cœur disponible, d'ouvrir notre intelligence pour recevoir cette parole. Te demandons par Jésus-Christ, ton Fils, qui règne avec toi pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're in the book of Romans, chapter 1. Let's remember that we are looking at the topic, the just shall live by faith. That is, the righteous, those who believe God and imputed to their account is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, shall live spiritually and eternally. By faith, that persuasion of heart and soul spiritually. We have been in Romans chapter 1. We have also seen the same in Galatians chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 10, the practical of the just shall live by faith. As well as in the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 2. We also see uh, mentioned in James 2 how that uh, the just shall live by faith is perfected by works of faith in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here in Romans chapter 1, we have defined this gospel. Remember that Romans... Uh, tells us the power of the gospel concerning the just shall live by faith. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. At it, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That gospel is declared and defined to us in chapter 1 through 7. It is, a, it is according to the gospel or according to the Holy Scriptures. It is concerning Jesus Christ, his son, deity, who came in perfect sinless flesh through the seed of David. And we looked at that importance, that um, it is the Davidic covenant of our Lord Jesus Christ, an everlasting uh, king, an everlasting throne, an everlasting reign. Um, and, and so we understand that Jesus Christ fulfills that, an everlasting kingdom. Declared the Son in verse 4, deity. And we, should, we see here the power, holiness uh, of God. And God's holiness is the consummation of the righteousness of God and the power according to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now in verse 5, we looked at grace and apostleship and obedience to the faith of all nations for his name. And we defined grace and we defined obedience. We came to verse 6. The called of Jesus Christ. Those that have been elect or called infinitely by his divine unmerited favor before the worlds began. I would like now to cover some of the practical points of this letter to the Romans that should apply to us concerning the just shall live by faith. In verse 8. He says, your faith 
is spoken of throughout the world. And in verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now, I would like to just give a few points that we're going to notice quickly in practical uh, in the practical emphasis. One is um, their testimony, their faith. They had a faith, these believers. Now remember that the Roman church was a church that was um, a congregations scattered uh, throughout Rome. Uh, you wouldn't dare meet say, in the city of Rome uh, there because you would be certainly persecuted, uh, maybe even treated as a criminal because the Romans uh, believed in the Greco-Roman gods and that Caesar was a demigod. So uh, they had to meet in secret and in different places uh, throughout their time there as believers. Later on, the Christians would be thrown out of Rome under Nero. And so uh, we know the Roman uh, government, the Roman people, recognized the Christians. And it says, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So when we're looking at the just shall live by faith, there needs to be a testimony of faith. A testimony of faith. Now, to get a good look at that, what that might look at like, look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look, and we'll start in verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we will start in verse 4. Knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. For ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that ye were an example to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. That word sounded out is the word trumpet, trumpet, the instrument trumpet. Um, it would be trumpeted out the word of the Lord. But also in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad so that we need not to ask anything. So as we are those who are beneficiaries of the just shall live by faith, we also need to have that testimony of faith. And that needs to be seen throughout the world. And that's what the Christian church is about. And it is that propagation or the sending forth of the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And even from a place, hard places, difficult places, like the Democratic Republic of Congo, where it is very difficult, your faith is spread abroad and others can see it. And this is where the practical comes in. The just live by faith. And we're to be doing that in our daily life. We're to be living up to who we are 
in Christ Jesus. These Thessalonians were like the Romans in that their faith was spread abroad. And we need to be sure that we have a manner of life in which our faith stands out and is, and is, and is shed abroad. In verse 9 of First Thessalonians chapter 1, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had among you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Just as Paul mentioned in Romans 1, I am separated under the gospel. And here the Thessalonians were separated unto God from idols to serve the living and true God. And so we must be separated from ancestral worship, from false doctrine, uh, from... Um, from compromising association with the gospel and be separated unto God so that we can serve the living and true God. Now verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. So now we return now, please, to the book of Romans. The book of Romans chapter 1. So in practical teaching, in our practical teaching here, we want to mark that down. That we have a faith as we are serving the living and true God. Uh, and that we, we become an example and we have a uh, testimony of faith that is propagated for others to be encouraged in the faith. Now in Romans chapter 1 verse 9. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. That without ceasing... I make mention of you always in my prayers. I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now we see that Paul calls God to witness um, many times in, in his epistles. God is my witness unto this or God is my witness unto this other thing that he does in serving the Lord. And that is a couple of things I just want to mention. Uh, God is witness to what we do. Uh, and we must always remember we're not only to be a witness for God, but God is a witness to us or uh, concerning us what we do. And we see service uh, has been emphasized here. I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. So we have a testimony of Paul. We have his testimony throughout. We see a lot of the word I, first personal pronoun, being used throughout here. In verse 8, first I thank my God through Christ Jesus for you all. Uh, here I in verse 9, I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Also in verse 9, I make mention of you always in my prayers. In verse 10, uh, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Remember that when Paul had written this book of Romans, he had yet to have met them in Rome. Verse 11, I long to see you. I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Uh, verse 12, that is, that I may be comforted together with you. Verse 13, um, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. I purpose to come unto you. I might have some fruit among you. Verse 14, I'm a debtor, both to the Greeks, to the barbarians. Verse 15, so as much as in me is, 
I'm ready to preach the gospel. In verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. There's a lot of eyes here. These are testimonies of Paul to the Romans uh, concerning this gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I would like to emphasize here Paul's uh, unceasing, faithful, constant ministry of prayer. Um, this is a paramount to the Christian life. First of all, Paul says in verse 8, I thank my God through Christ Jesus for you all. In many epistles, epistles, we see Paul thanking God for the Christian believers in these various areas. Um, this, he was giving thanks to God for the believers. And brethren, we ought to be giving thanks to God continually with our lips. The book of Hebrews chapter 13 verses uh, 10 through 13. Uh, that is the responsibility of a believer priest to be giving thanks continually unto God. Uh, we just studied uh, here at Chillicothe Bible Church on Tuesday evenings. Seven times a day I give thee praise. I wonder if we put that in our calendars to praise God seven times a day and to give thanksgiving for one another. Uh, so important to give thanks. Now in verse 9 he says, Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Uh, if you notice, uh, each time I come on, I ask for prayer requests so that we can mention to God intelligently and specifically prayers, petitions to God at His will concerning one another. Paul, uh, in just about every book, mentions concerning each group written to that he is praying unceasingly or constantly for them. There must be a strong prayer life, may I say. Prayer is communication to and with God by faith. It is an expression of faith. Now I'm going to spend a minute looking at this concerning prayer. First, let's drop off in the book of Romans. Turn to the book of Romans, if you will please. Chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Uh, and it says in chapter 12 and in verse 12. Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing diligently in prayer. Uh, prayer, uh, the idea of our life really is that we live our life as a prayer life. We ought to be constantly in the mode of prayer. I understand we take time specifically to pray per day. But this is living a prayerful life. This is bringing everything under consideration by prayer. Prayer is simply communicating to God and, and also meditating in His answers to you. He answers us through the Word of God. He answers us by the works He does on our behalf. Uh, here it says, diligently, con continuing diligently in prayer. The idea here is instant, instant in prayer. Um, how many times we take on things ourselves 
without conversation with God. And prayer is communicating and conversing with God. You and I have been given the express grace and invited to his presence through Jesus Christ in prayer. A prayer is not just for the priest or the minister. Prayer is for all of us. We've been made believer priests. And we must develop a prayer life. Now, I would like to look for a moment again uh, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, one more time. 1 Thessalonians, and we'll look at two points here while we're here. Back in the book of 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, first of all, we're going to stop off in, ver in chapter 2. Chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2. Now, notice in chapter 2 and verse 10, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we labored ourselves among you that believe. Uh, we see Paul once again calling not only God in his witness, but the Thessalonican believers. Okay, our present point, instant in prayer. Uh, it's a very short verse. We call these emphatics. They're very short sentences. And in, ver in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We have some emphatics here that pertain to our point in Romans. Verse 16. Rejoice evermore. In verse 17. Pray without ceasing. In verse 18. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, give thanks. Okay, so we see prayer without ceasing. Paul said that I make mention of you without ceasing, unceasingly in prayer. So Paul was constantly giving petition before God for these Roman believers unceasingly. Now, an example of that can be found in the book of Acts. Well, before we go to Acts, I'm sorry. Don't, don't turn yet. Go to the book of Philippians. It will make it easier. Go back a couple of books to the book of Philippians. Chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and in verses 4 through 7. Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 7. When we communicate with God in prayer, we ought to acknowledge and give thanks first for God himself, who he is. And what he has done for us. Uh, then we ought to be confessing our sin. Um, the book of 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says. That if we acknowledge or confess our sins. He is reliable and righteous. To keep on cleansing us for, from sin. And this is in the practical sense that our fellowship with God remains unhindered from sin. We must bring our petitions before him. Uh, these are the desires or the needs. 
and they're brought before God. And they ought to be brought before God according to his will. We must ask God's will uh, concerning our petitions because we know not how to pray as we ought. And God knows all things. The book of Romans chapter 8 teaches us that the Holy Spirit assists us in prayer, helps us in prayer, and intercedes for us in prayer concerning God's will. Now, in Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 7, we see that Paul is in prison. This is what we call one of the prison epistles. And he says in chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all. The Lord is at hand. He is near. He is at the ready. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Notice this contrast. Be anxious for nothing. It reminds us of Matthew chapter 6. What being anxious does. And it is borrowing trouble for the days of he ahead. But sufficient unto the day is its own problems. We need not borrow problems. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter tells us, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. No one cares for you more than your Savior, your Master, your King, your Lord Jesus Christ. Now in Philippians 4, notice, be anxious for nothing but in everything. Now, just a moment ago, we read, and everything give thanks. Here it says we're to pray about everything. Uh, it is unceasing, instant, continuously diligent. So, really, the Bible demands that our life be a prayer life. By prayer, verse 6 now of Philippians 4 by prayer and supplication. Now, supplication is a very important part of prayer. Suppliant comes from the root of that, comes from the word, comes from one who bears an olive branch. That's a suppliant. Uh, when someone is bearing an olive branch, uh, they are coming to uh, present their case and to ask for um, and to ask for compliance, um, and so that's the word suppliant. And to supplicate is to plea uh, our cause or plea uh, our problem, uh, and try to meet to some resolution. That's supplication. Probably the most famous supplication in all the Bible is when Jesus is in the garden and he prays to the Father, Abba, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That is a supplication. Now, in this verse, verse 6, with thanksgiving. And we just spoke about that. In everything, give thanks. The, of, of all the people on the earth, the believer ought to be the most grateful. Uh, they say that gratitude is the least, um, is the least expressed um, uh, expression. <laughs> 
and it lasts not long. But our lives is to be constantly in thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Now, a request, that is something that a quest is something that is something we are looking forward to do or a task to be done, something that needs to be done. And we're told in the book of Matthew chapter 7, ask, seek, and knock continually. And there needs, that's why we have the word re, R-E again, requests be made known unto God. Um, these things need to be made known to God by communicating with him unceasingly, continuous, diligently, continually, uh, without ceasing, instant in prayer. Now we're told the benefit therein in verse 7. And the peace of God. This is not the peace with God. One must have peace with God to experience the peace of God. Uh, which passeth all understanding. That is the tranquility of mind, heart, and spirit. Um, and we can be at peace when? Always. We can be at peace in war. Because this peace passes all understanding. And it says, shall garrison your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, this is a very quick idea about prayer. And I know I went through it rather quickly. And if you'll review uh, this on YouTube, it will be helpful. But in the Christian life, there must be a powerful prayer life. We are those who are the ones who are just uh, justified or the just shall live by faith. And this is how we're to live. Paul is giving his personal testimony in these verses. And in his personal testimony is the fact that without ceasing... He is praying for these Roman believers. Now, let's go back to the book of Romans, if you will, please. Romans chapter 1. In verse 10, here Paul now is making requests. We just discussed that in Philippians, didn't we? Look in verse 10. Making requests. This is something Paul has put before the Lord many times, and he's requesting, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Uh, Paul so wanted to come to Rome. And um, I can imagine uh, Paul wanted to be in the center of things. If you read the book of Acts closely, Paul would go to the larger metropolitan areas when he would come to some place or some country, such as Corinth and Achaia, um, such as Ephesus in Asia Minor. Uh, these places were the central focus, such as Corinth, um, they, were, they were central thoroughfares in the Roman Empire in those days. And Paul uh, had a, had a uh, heavy desire to come to Rome. And Rome was the center of the world at that time, uh, the Roman Empire. And Paul wanted to be in the center. Uh, and he wanted to be with these believers. He says... A prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Now, this prospering is not the prosperity movement. Paul was not looking to get rich off of these believers monetarily. The prosperous, the prosperity he's talking about is spiritually prosperous. Now, let me uh, just give one passage concerning that from the book of uh, Psalms. 
Psalms chapter 1, the introduction to the largest book of the Bible, the book of praise. It's also a book of wisdom. Uh, it was the hymnal, if you will, of, of uh, Israel. And if you look in the book of Psalms, chapter 1, spiritually prosperous. And Paul's going to tell us how that is in a moment. Psalms chapter 1 and in verse 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now these are prerequisites to this spiritual prosperity. I want to make it clear what it is. And he shall be like a tree. Now we have a, a metaphor, if you will. Uh, the one who does these things, who delights in the law of God, meditates day and night. Uh, his walk is after the counsel of God, not the ungodly. His way is not in the way of sinners, but in the way of the Lord. And he is seated at the uh, presence of God, not with the scornful. And notice, if you will, by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season, its leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He will be fruitful. He will be fruitful in spiritual things. Now, that was Paul's desire. That was his request, to have a prosperous journey by the will of God. Uh, Paul wanted God's will for these Romans above all things. God's will is the spiritually heaven-directed and best result uh, that God can produce. And this will is what we must always um, acquire and look for. It is God's will, not our will. God's will be done. Now, verse 11. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. Now, I think that as we're looking at these things, I want us to appreciate how we're to interact with one another. When Paul comes, he's coming prayerfully, and he's requesting that there be prosperity of spiritual things, spiritual fruitfulness, and he's coming to impart something to them. Uh, this is the key to gathering together. It is to ectify, to build up the body of Christ. Um, it is not what can I get from you. It is rather what I can impart to others. And I want you to notice that. Uh, this is the prerogative of our gathering together, that we might impart to one another the spiritual gift that God has given us. Now, just one passage on the idea of the spiritual gift. Look in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, yet another prison epistle. And look in chapter 4 and in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 11. We'll also go back to Romans 12 for this significant point um, everyone is gifted by God through the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ and we're to bring our gifts as we come together now um, that is how we edify that's how the church is perfected or matured and I want to emphasize the purpose of the gifts uh, the gifts are not, get, are not just to be displayed emotionally for that end only. It's to have a spiritual 
residual impact. So look in Romans chapter 4. I'm sorry. I messed up. I'm sorry. Correction. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets. Now the word apostles is in the lower case. It's not a capital A. He gave some apostles sent ones. This would include not only the apostles of the age, but those that were sent out. Uh, missionaries, for example. And some prophets. This is not Old Testament prophets. This was the New Testament prophets, and their main prerogative uh, was to edify the body of believers. And some evangelists. A good example of an evangelist would be Philip in the book of Acts chapter 8. And notice, and some pastor teachers. This is shepherds and instructors. Till we all come. Now notice in verse 12, two great purposes. Number one. The maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry. Number two, the edifying of the body of Christ. The building up spiritually of the body of Christ. For the perfecting of the saints, the set apart ones. For the work of the ministry. Um, this maturing has a direct purpose. And that's to do the work of the ministry. Uh, Paul uh, tells uh, and edifies others, do the work of an evangelist. Um, and that would, be, uh, that would be the same idea of perfecting. It's for the work of the ministry. And second, for the building up of the body of Christ. And when we're talking about the body of Christ in Ephesians, we're talking about the mystical union of believers spiritually in Christ Jesus. It has a goal in mind. And here's the goal. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man under the measure of the stature of the completeness of Christ. This is the lofty and spiritual goal. And that is that we might be more conformed to the image of his son. Uh, that we might be those uh, who through practice, unity, and knowledge of the son of God uh, mature to the measure of the completeness of Christ Jesus. Now I'd like to spend a message on that, but we haven't time for it. Now I'd like us to go back, if you will, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 12, and we'll have to end with this, and then I'll have a review in French, and then we'll move forward from there. Look in Romans, chapter 12, verse 3. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Verse 3, Romans 12. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. That means spiritually on target. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing, according to the grace that is given to me, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. 
or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth in taunt teaching, he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with liberality, he that ruleth or administration with diligence, he that showeth mercy with all cheerfulness. These also are practical gifts in character that are personified by the members of Christ toward one another. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and it is 8.50 my time. I need to, to stop right here. We'll look at this idea of establishment next time we're together, and I will mark it. And I'm going to have uh, Dr. Karume, if you could have uh, you or someone, please summarize in French. I would appreciate it. No, Pastor Ted, no need for me to summarize in French. These people attending have seen Rachel uh, and uh, Mondo. Mondo is taking his PhD in Nigeria in English. He's writing his PhD in English. Rachel is in South Africa taking course in English. They have been able to follow you. So no need to make a summary. If they have questions, please yes. ask questions. Questions would Mondo, be good. Rachel. I should thank God for Pastor Ted today because uh, the teaching were, was really uh, edifying the way you were saying. And uh, I noted the point. So you, you talked about the test. We have to give testimony, testimony of faith. We need also to have a constant life of prayer. We also be giving uh, thanksgiving, but also confessing. My questions are. Uh, mostly on um, so I have two questions but three questions but two are related the first one is um, so in the teaching you said that we have to be uh, showing our request to God but that should be in accordance to his will and now I wanted to know when how to know that our prayer or our request is in accordance uh, accordance to God's will. But also the second question which is related to that one. Is that, Ted, have you got that? I've got it. God's will. Got it. Our request, our, can, can, can we know that our request is according to God's will? Okay, I have that first question. Okay. Yes. The, the second one which is related to that one is now how to know when to stop praying for a particular request. Because uh, I don't know if we can pray uh, all life for a, a request. How to know that this one, we should now stop praying for it. Okay. The other question, the other question, the, the other question is, uh, is more explanation. When, when, we, we, when, when you, we read uh, in Ephesians 4.12, about uh, the spiritual gifts and among the gifts you cited evangelists and teachers you went back to roman 12 3 you added ministers and then i wanted to know which is the difference between the three because for me evangelist teacher and minister i take them like uh, one function Thank oh, you. okay you're welcome let me deal with will of god um, the will of God is that which is the most perfect desired outcome for you. And this is developed in a relationship between you and the Lord. What I want to spend time on is how that comes about. Uh, and in the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 27... Likewise, the Spirit also aids or helpeth our infirmity or weakness. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, 
Now that means we're not God. We don't know what the outcomes will be, but God does. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us. Now intercession is something we didn't touch on. It is, uh, it is pleading on the behalf of another. Pleading on the behalf of another. Um, that with us, with groanings which cannot be uttered, it is in spiritual language. Now verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is uh, the mind of the spirit. Because the Spirit maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That best result for you. Now this really goes with verse 28. And we know that God worketh all things together for good uh, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his sovereign doing purpose so let's understand what the will of God can be for example for Jesus Christ it was to go ahead and die on the cross to take the cup of agony so don't associate will of God with a happy ending in the sense of how we see it it is God's best desire to and for us and that is experienced by us. We know that through how God is dealing with us in our daily life. So I, you know, there's no, uh, each one of these situations in our life has a different ending, has a different answer for each and every one of us. That is an experimental um, daily uh, experience that you have with God. Now, when do we stop praying for something? When we feel that God has answered it. Um, and God can answer us in many ways. It may be that what we're praying for is not good for us. And so the answer is no. It may be that what we're praying for uh, God has a different plan than we think for us. Uh, it may be that the thing that is needed, God answers it directly, as we might think. But never judge God's answers according to your personal view or what you think ought to happen. Um, I know that prayer is taught and misinterpreted all over the world. They make the, uh, they, they say prayer is a gift, which it isn't. It is not mentioned in any list of gifts. Prayer is a uh, privileged responsibility of the believer. And the idea of prayer is to seek God's will, not just our benefit. So I hope that makes, that makes things more clear about what prayer is for. Um, and that might help with your questions. Again, that's personal when you stop praying for something. Um, and then the last, the difference between evangelist, minister, and pastor. Okay, pastors more specifically are overseers. They are overseers of the blood bought of Christ. Pastor and elder are very close, but the pastor is directly over all of the uh, body of Christ. Uh, when it comes to a local body, he's the recognized gifted man. That gift is not a career or position. That gift is is a placement of responsibility. Uh, when you become a minister, your personal life is over. Uh, you are there as the gifted person to oversee 
what God has sent you to do. An evangelist. I would, I would ask you to look in the book of Acts chapter 8 and follow the ministry of Philip. And later on in the book of Acts, Philip arrives on the scene again and meets Paul. Um, this would be the work of an evangelist. He's one that is sent out to a certain place at a certain time to give the gospel primarily of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it is directly in reference to salvation of souls. Uh, Paul tells Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, do the work of an evangelist. Okay, so minister or ministering. Um, this is the job of everyone. Uh, everyone is to minister to one another. It's the action of, of putting forth uh, the word of God to others, ministering. Now, obviously, the overseer is also a minister and an evangelist <laughs> uh, because he's going to give the gospel. Uh, he's going to uh, put forth the scriptures to minister to the church. Um, angels are called ministering spirits, just to give you an idea of the word minister. Um, they have a specific role or thing God wants them to do toward his saints or in the world. So ministering is more, um, it, 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 is, it, is, um, uh, it is a, it is a larger scope in its, in its word. Because we all minister to one another. So when we are working in the church, the Holy Spirit is equipping us to minister to one another, for example. Um, so I hope that those three definitions are of help to you, and I hope I have answered your questions. Yes, thank you. You're welcome, and I appreciate those questions. Thank you. Yes, the, the remaining one, so is now evangelist and teacher. I'm sorry? Evangelists and a teacher, what is the difference between the two? All right, a teacher, okay, a teacher is one who is instructing. He's instructing. Uh, in other words, he's going to give the instruction uh, specifically and contextually out of the Word of God to others. Does that help? Russia. Russia. Okay. This was for you. The teaching today's teaching was for you. 